Welcome. I'm really glad that we're going to take some time together to talk about how we can change our political and social environment in our nation, in our personal relationships, our families, our workplaces. Today, what we're going to do is we're going to look at biases, sort of mental quirks that we all have, and we're going to try to minimize those biases. And we're going to look at common logical fallacies that are connected to those biases. Because we have these quirky brains, we unwittingly manipulate other people or we allow ourselves to be manipulated by others, especially those in power. And so what we want to do today is become more empowered, become more reflective and learn better how to uh, get along with each other and have true conversation, really build a community. The, the motto of America is out of many, one. And right now we're just out of many chaos. Uh, we're out of many, many. The first thing we're going to talk about is our quirky brains. We tend to be much uh, so proud of our brains. We think of ourselves as objective data analyzers, kind of like computers, but in a better form. You know, we got this great uh, skin and bones and flesh, uh, but uh, we're not. Uh, we've got weird brains, they've come about through weird processes, and it's exciting actually to explore and to, and to recognize all the different kinds of influences on our beliefs and on our feelings. So today we're going to take a look at the biases that are a part of just how our quirky brains are, are wired, and then the fallacies that people use to exploit uh, these weirdnesses, these weirdnesses in our brains. So we're going to explore logical fallacies, we're going to explore biases, and then we're going to take a look at how we can make a difference. And making a difference always starts by looking inward. I really think that the stalemate we're in, the division, the bitterness in our country is at root an issue of character. Because if we want to think more clearly, we will, but it's about our desire. And so we'll talk a little bit about that at the end as well. I think to do this well requires your whole self. Um, and it's something that I'm working on and, and I know it takes time. Uh, and so this is something that requires you to be healthy physically, mentally, and spiritually. If you are a whole person who has strong self-esteem and has fortitude and character, then you can actually change your ways of thinking and change your ways of interacting with people and you can make a difference in the world. So the first thing we're going to do is talk about our biases and quirks. What I'm going to do is start off with the roots of bias and then look at specific biases that we hold. And in each case, what I want to do is introduce you to logical fallacies that tie into that bias. Our politicians and their managers can use these fallacies, sometimes purposefully, to manipulate us. So we want to talk about those. The roots of bias, first off, come from the fact that you and I use simplifying heuristics. This means that we don't have enough time every day to do a very detailed, analytical and problem solving system for every decision we have to make. We're just too busy. And this is true with our political lives and with our voting. How many students have I talked to who are frustrated? They don't have time to get informed on the issues. And so what we do is we have these simplifying heuristics that actually help us make decisions quickly. These heuristics are actually pretty effective. They're pretty good but they have weaknesses as well because they are not a thorough thought process. They're shortcuts, they're quick methods for making decisions, they're not really carefully thought through. The second thing is that we are narrative beings. We are addicted to teleological thinking. And maybe addiction's a, a strong word because that's usually a negative thing. It's actually a beautiful thing. Humans have been storytellers since the dawn of time. And so we love to think in terms of a narrative. So when events happen, we see ourselves as characters, other people as villains, other people uh, as, as uh, bit players, right? And there's a beginning, there's a problem, there's possible solutions, there's a vision, there's destiny. So we always, whenever we see evidence just sitting out there, we tend to place it into a story an overarching narrative or theme. And our politicians will do this as well. The Republicans have these overarching narratives about the Democrats. The Democrats have them about the Republicans. And this means that we just are telling broad stories that may or may not be supported by evidence, especially when we give those broad stories as evidence for our position on specific issues. 
And then just generally speaking, uh, again, we're human beings. So we're deeply interconnected. We have needs and desires and emotions, fears, commitments, right? There's things that we have committed to, we've believed for a long time, or we've committed to a way of life, right? All of these things uh, influence not just what we think and believe, but how we experience the world. You and I will experience the same event very differently because we're different human beings. And, uh, and we don't want to break from our previous decisions. And we don't want to, to go against our desires. We're motivated by fear. Um, we're, we're kind of messed up, but it's a beautiful mess, right? And what we want to find out is how do we embrace it, celebrate it, and then, and then try to, um, to move forward in a way that's intelligent and reasoned and that pr promotes community and, uh, and love. Right. So what I want to say is that the first fallacy and one of the things you'll notice is in the PowerPoint uh, fallacies are, are in yellow. So that's an official fallacy. There are some other uh, ways of acting or thinking or arguing uh, that I put in white. And so the first kind of fallacy that we stumble into because we use simplifying heuristics is missing the point. Missing the point comes when you give uh, evidence that seems related to the conclusion because it is um, uh, because it's in the same uh, subject area, but it really doesn't. It really isn't related. So, for instance, if I said, "Man, people have been breaking in and stealing a lot of car radios all over our neighborhood. It's time to reinstitute the death penalty," right? That argument misses the point. Yes, there's there's car radios being stolen. But what does the death penalty have to do with that? It has nothing to do with it. But if you're thinking quickly, especially you're listening to a debate and it's one point to the next, to the next, to the next, you might think that the person just gave a, a good argument for the death penalty when the, the premises, car radios being stolen, have nothing to do with the death penalty. So missing the point is a fallacy we, we run into. The other is a false cause fallacy. And this is a heuristic we use way too often. Um, two things, one thing follows the other, and we assume that the second thing was caused by the first. Uh, but that is uh, often not the case. It, there's so many coincidences. So if a politician says, you know, since Trump became president, uh, this and that has happened. And we say, oh, Trump, that's terrible. You know, Trump did these, these uh, terrible things. He is the cause of the this and that that happened. Um, but that's, that's a, a false cause fallacy. Just because one thing happened first and two other things happened second, we, um, it doesn't mean that the first caused the second. Or you say, you know, when Obama came into office, uh, he was in office six months and then this happened and that happened. And those are bad things. It's a false cause fallacy. We have to go much deeper to figure out, well, why do these things happen? You know, why, do, why does the... Um, uh, why does the unemployment rate go up or down? Why does uh, the, the dollar strengthen or get weaker? Right? Why are there more hate crimes or fewer hate crimes? And you have to look at the causes of those things. You have to look at social scientific studies. But we don't have time. That's why we use simplifying uh, heuristics. Uh, and so we use heuristics because we don't have the time to think clearly. False, we're so easily tricked into a false cause. Politicians will use this all the time because this happened and then this happened. This event is responsible for that event, but it's, those aren't necessarily logically connected. I would say that uh, the most common fallacy used in political discussions is suppressed evidence. Um, and this is uh, where you just leave out the other side of the story, right? It's very easy to be at a rally or to be giving a, a town hall and to tell just, your, just the evidence that supports your side and you leave out the other. Well, that's what we're doing a lot of the time with heuristics, right? Uh, we've had some experiences in the past and relationships. Those have impressed us and we just pay attention to that side and we ignore the other side. So suppressed evidence is a fallacy uh, that's a real problem for us. And then arguments by analogy. <laughs> uh, we use these all the time. Politicians use them all the time. And if you can just show there's a similarity between, between the unemployment rate and how you would raise a child, right? People are like, yes, you're exactly right. But there's so many dissimilarities between the unemployment rate and raising a child. 
that um, it's not a good argument. And yet it's simple, it's a heuristic, we can make a quick decision. So because we tend to use heuristics, and that's because we have to, because of our busy human lives, we are susceptible to these fallacies, missing the point, false, false cause fallacies, suppressed evidence where other, other very important points are left out, and these arguments by analogy that leave a lot to be desired. Now, our teleological thinking um, also leads us to a certain kind of fallacy. And this, again, is suppressed evidence. Why, why is there suppressed evidence? Or, or why does teleological thinking lead, it to, lead us to it? It's because teleological thinking, we're thinking of a story. Well, anyone who's ever written a story knows that you have to cut parts out for flow. Right. Or how many times we've seen a movie and say that was good, but the, the, uh, the uh, director did a terrible job with the cut. Right. It needed to be shorter or they put in too much or it was too short. We needed more information. And so you and I, every time we take in information, we're fitting it into a story. And if it's if it's evidence that doesn't fit into our story, we just tend to throw it out or not even notice it. Right. So that's the fallacy of suppressed evidence. When you give evidence that does support a conclusion, but it only supports the conclusion because you've left out crucial evidence that points the other direction. Right. So our teleological thinking naturally moves us towards uh, falling into the trap of a suppressed evidence uh, fallacy. The same thing's true with appeal to tradition. A lot of our macro narratives have to do with human nature, who we are as individuals, uh, society, civilization. And so tradition is very important to us. And so uh, one argument that can be stated or just implied could be this is the way we've always done it. And therefore, it, it, that's a good reason to keep doing it. There's no connection to the fact that we've always done something a certain way, that we should do it in the future. Uh, slavery was a long standing tradition, right? Women not having the vote was a long standing tradition. So just because something's a tradition does not mean it's good. And yet appeals to tradition work on us more than they should because we're narrative beings and we're trying to tell a story to ourselves and our meaning comes from where we fit in that story. And then we also have the false cause fallacy again with teleological thinking, right? Because we, we think teleological thinking means that we tend to, to see that everything has a meaning or a purpose. You tell a story, something happens here and it causes something else here. My wife and I were just watching a Jordan Peele story and it starts off with a certain uh, discussion of something that was just kind of hanging out there. And then my wife in the middle of the movie said, ooh, that's going to come in here, right? Well, she's thinking in a narrative teleological way, and she was right. Um, but in the real world, uh, just because something precedes something else or something's a part of the story, it doesn't mean that it's going to lead to anything else in the story. Right. So this is a false cause uh, fallacy that that feeds into our knack for teleological thinking. Finally, um, a very annoying fallacy uh, in politics is the slippery slope argument. I think that both sides in this election will, will you, you will have heard things like, if Trump is elected, this will be the last free election that we ever have, right? He's a totalitarian. He's going to uh, bring in a police state because he has these totalitarian tendencies. This will lead to that. That will lead to this. Or um, if we elect uh, Joe Biden as president, um, you're going to give up your freedoms. They're going to make uh, uh, Christian expression illegal. You know, we're going to be a communist country. Uh, that's a slippery slope argument where you say, if this happens, this will happen. If that happens, the next thing will happen and so forth. The problem is that the likelihood of each one of these chains, uh, each one of the events in the chain happening is very small. And so it's a very weak form of argument. But you and I, we're susceptible to it because we're teleological thinkers. We think in terms of stories. Things tend to get to progress. We've seen so many tragedies where one little thing leads to the next and it starts snowballing. So it's because we're narrative beings that people can use a slippery slope argument on us, a slippery slope fallacy, and we fall right into it. And so we have to watch out for that. And then finally, just our general humanity. 
<clears throat> the fact that we are uh, human beings uh, that have needs and desires, emotions, previous experiences. Politicians know that if they appeal to our fears and to our desires, that um, they can move us. And that they, what they're doing is they're moving us by our fears and desires, which means they're, not, uh, they're bypassing our intellect. Uh, Immanuel Kant said that it is our rational freedom, our rational autonomy, which gives us a dignity, which puts us above all price. And yet our politicians, and you and I do this to one another, we bypass people's rational freedom. We don't respect their dignity as human beings. We go directly to appeals, to fear, to insults and the like. And so um, uh, this is uh, despicable. Um, but we don't even realize it's being done to us. This is what advertising does and has been doing forever, right? So we have one of the things that I'm going to mention later, as far as a key to for us to grow individually and together, we need to be aware of our own needs, our own desires, our own fears, and how they motivate us, how they influence our narratives. When we're aware of them, we'll recognize when someone is manipulating us through them. Right. So appeals to the people. There's a variety of these. Um, there's the appeal to fear, which is used a lot in elections. There's the appeal to vanity. Like we are the in group who really understands everyone else are, are idiots. They're outsiders. They don't love America. Um, they um, uh, they don't love the poor. They don't love justice. Like, oh, I'm one of the in group. Like that's one of our basic desires is we want to be in the in group. We want to be accepted and respected. And so uh, when, whenever we appeal, whenever our politicians appeal to the, that desire to be respected, uh, that's a version of the appeal to the people called the appeal to vanity. And that happens a lot in, in uh, political speeches. And again, we have the slippery slope fallacy because of our humanity. If I'm afraid of something, if I'm afraid of communism, if I'm afraid of totalitarianism, if I'm afraid of dictatorship, if I, um, uh, if I, I'm afraid of a single payer health care system, if I'm afraid of, um, of uh, closed borders or whatever it is, I, I can, it'll make me more likely to believe that the chain of events in a slippery slope that's presented to me will actually occur. And so I'm vulnerable to it. And finally, the red herring. This is a fallacy where you ask someone one question, they kind of start by answering the question and then they pivot and talk about something completely different. Well, this happens in every single debate, right? Uh, the moderators probably need to learn better how to uh, make people answer questions and not go forward until they do. But uh, you and I are susceptible to the, to the red herring. We're very distractible because we're human beings, right? So if a person pivots and then starts talking about something we agree with, we're like, yeah, that's right. And we even forget the fact that they haven't answered the question. So the roots of our bias, I'm giving, I'm giving us three here, heuristics, teleological or narrative thinking, and then the catch-all category of our humanity, our needs, our desires, our emotions, our fears, our, our concrete commitments. These make us vulnerable to bias, and every single one of us is biased in these ways because we're human beings, and it makes us susceptible to the kinds of fallacies that I've listed here.